Hello, this is a short presentation to introduce a maple workbook for calculating the far field radiation pattern from an antenna array. Um, a handy rule of thumb is that the maximum gain from an antenna array is equal to the number of array elements. Um, it's fairly easy to show this just using superposition, which is what's going on here. Um, but what it means is that if you're a distance from an antenna and you would like to double the received power, you just double the number of transmit antennas and you'll achieve a, a gain of two and four antenna elements will give you a gain of four and so on. But of course, um, the gain is dependent also on the phase relationship of the signal arriving from each of the array elements. So it's not quite as simple as just adding the number of antennas. Um, so to take account of the phase from each of the antenna elements, we need to know how far we are from the antenna elements. So this model um, is, you can see I've, I've got array elements represented here as these blue dots. Um, I've only shown a two dimensional array because otherwise the picture becomes rather cluttered. Um, but uh, but actually this model calculates the distance from an antenna element in a three dimensional array. And the convention I've used I've used is that along the X axis, the end, the element number um, moves from one, two, three and four. So I'm starting at one, not zero. Um, and in the Z axis, I start at C equals one, two, three, four. Um, and this expression here gives the vector A, which describes the position of the an antenna element. So vector A is a vector from the origin to the antenna element that we're interested in. And this expression describes it. So little a is the element number. So that's element one, two, three. Large A is the number of elements along the X axis. Um, we've got small b and uppercase B for the Y axis and then C and uppercase C for the Z axis. So this element here is A equals one, C equals one. This is A equals two, C equals one and so on. So this is the expression for the array element that we're interested in. Um, when we're calculating the gain of an array, we're interested in comparing it with an isotropic antenna at the origin. Um, so the vector from the origin to our observation point I've called P. Um, and so the vector that describes the distance from the antenna element to the observation point is P minus A. And you can check that if we go to the antenna using vector A and then travel along P minus A, that's the same as vector P. So this is vector P minus A. So P minus A gives us the distance from the antenna element to our observation point. OK, so here's A. I've just um, put it into maple and P I've expressed using spherical coordinates. Um, and that's because when we're studying antenna patterns, we're only really interested in the angle um, theta and phi. So if we want to calculate the phase difference between each of these array elements at our observation point, first of all, we need to know the difference in path length. So remember, the distance from the antenna element to the observation point is P minus A. So if we go down here, you can see that this expression here, path left length difference, is P minus A. And I've changed P into Cartesian coordinates using Maple's change basis function. So there's P minus A. That's the distance from the antenna element to the observation point. And R is the length of the P vector. There you go. You can see R is the length of the P vector. So R minus P minus A, that's the difference in the path length um, from the origin to our observation point compared to the antenna element to our observation point. So this is the path length dif difference. Um, you can see it's quite a complicated expression, but we can simplify it um, because we're only interested in studying the antenna pattern in the far field. So we can use Maple's limit function and set the observation distance to be infinite. 
and then the path left length difference simplifies to this, which looks a lot nicer. Now we know the difference in path lengths, we can calculate the phase difference by multiplying by 2 pi over lambda. So that's what we've done here. Um, and then this exponential describes the field strength at our observation point P. Um, and you can see there's H0 is the magnitude of the magnetic field strength. Um, and then we've got exponential to the power J, omega T is the time varying component minus the phase difference that we've just calculated. But when we're calculating antenna arrays, uh, the, the gain of an antenna array, we're always going to compare it with an isotropic radiator. And this is the expression that you'd receive from an isotropic antenna placed at the origin. You can see we've got the time varying component and the phase difference has just gone to zero. So if we divide one by the other, we end up with an element phaser. So this expression describes the phase difference between the signal arriving from the origin, from our reference isotropic radiator, um, compared to the antenna element at whatever position we're at. So now we've got this, we can calculate the resultant by just summing the contributions from each of the array elements. So in this simple example, we've got two array elements. Um, you can see there are two elements on the Z axis um, and the uh, I've set capital A and capital B to one. So the, we only have two elements on the Z axis and I've set them half a wavelength apart. So we can sum all of these array elements like this. Maple makes it quite simple to do. You can see that I'm summing over the X, Y and Z axis. Uh, the X axis we sum from array element position one, which is the first position, all the way up to A. In this case, there is only one antenna element. But in the case of C, we've got two. We've set C to two. So there are two elements in the Z direction. And um, for each of these positions, we just add the element phases at each of these positions. And I've divided by the square root of the number of antenna elements. And that's because um, when we have an antenna array, we share the power between all the elements of the array. Um, so the sum, we're only interested in the magnitude of the sum, um, and that's going to give us the magnitude of the magnetic field strength. And then if we square that, we get power. Um, and then we can use Maple's plot 3D function to visualize that. And you can see we get this pleasing donut, which is exactly what we'd expect really. Um, in the Z direction, we have two array elements, one above the other in the Z direction. They're half wavelength apart. So obviously the signals are going to cancel. If you imagine a signal um, emanating from the lower array element, it arrives at the upper array element half of, half a wavelength out of phase, so it cancels. So there's no signal in the Z direction. But in the XY plane, wherever you are on the XY plane, you're always the same distance from both of the antenna elements, and so the signals will add. So we've got a gain of two in the XY plane and a gain of zero in the Z plane. And that gain of two is exactly what we would expect um, according to our simple rule of thumb, which is that the gain of an antenna array is equal to the number of elements. So we've got two elements, we've got a gain of two. So, so far, so good. This is all checking out. Next thing to try is just setting the separation distance between our two antenna elements to zero. Um, and when we do that, we get this, which is obviously wrong. Um, you can see we've got an isotropic radiation pattern, but we've got a gain of two in all directions, which can't be right. We're getting twice as much power out of the antenna as we're putting in. So something's gone badly wrong. To try and understand why, it's helpful to consider how you calculate the radiation pattern from an antenna um, using Maxwell's equations. You know, you have regard to the current flowing in the antenna. So this is a little Hertzian dipole here. And you use Maxwell's equations to calculate what you'd see in the far field. And the way you do it, the simplest method is using the Helmholtz decomposition theorem. Um, using these expressions to calculate the scalar and vector potentials. And if you want to see a little bit more about this, there's quite a good page on Wikipedia that explains um, how to use these uh, the Helmholtz decomp 
composition theorem and also gives a, a derivation. So this example here is for a Hertzian dipole. So this, these are the two dipole elements and those little red disks, those are, that shows DZ, the element that we're integrating over. And you basically integrate current along the length of the dipole. And when you do that, you calculate that the power flux density at our observation point here is equal to this expression. And you can see that power flux density is proportional to the current squared, the current flowing in the antenna element. And it's also inversely proportional to R squared, which is in inverse square law. Um, if you want to see how to calculate this, there's a post on Maple Primes that you can look at to see how this works. But basically, this expression here is for power flux density. In order to calculate power, you need to integrate over all solid angles. And then we calculate the gain for the Hertzian dipole by comparing the total power, which is the integral over all solid angles, to the power that you'd see for an isotropic radiator. So we could use that technique to create, uh, correct our antenna pattern calculations. But before we do that, it's worth looking at a Hertzian di uh, folded dipole. So a folded dipole, you have two dipole elements placed very, very closely together like this. Um, now, if this was a simple resistive circuit, you'd expect the current to come into the antenna element, flow up it along the top here and then flow down here and then flow back up and back out to the transmitter. But that's not the case. You can see the current here is going in the same direction as this current, which is not what you'd expect. But the reason is because the dipole's half a wavelength long, which means this length is quarter of a wavelength. So our current here is reducing to zero at this point, and then it changes sign and starts to build up again. So this sign change here, accounts for the fact that the currents are flowing in phase in both of these antenna elements. Now, if we were calculating the far field antenna pattern from a folded dipole using this method, um, we would assume that these two antennas are so closely spaced that we can regard them as being a single dipole antenna with twice the current driving it, because these two currents add um, so what this really means is that the spacing between these antenna elements is so small compared with the wavelength that if we had an observation point here, if it was possible to turn on just this antenna element and make a measurement of amplitude and phase here, and then we turn this element off and turn this element on, you'd get exactly the same amplitude and phase. And that means the amplitude and phase add in all directions. That's why we can assume this assembly of folded dipole antenna is equivalent to a dipole. And this yellow region here is called the source volume dV tick. And if we look at Helmholtz again, um, you can see there's the dV tick. And what we're doing when we're calculating the scalar and vector potentials is we're integrating over a 3D volume, which is this volume dV tick. Um, and because these antenna elements are so close together, we can assume these two antennas look like one antenna. Now, with a folded dipole, um, the radiation resistance is 292 ohms. So that means that the resistance seen looking into the antenna is 292 ohms. And the radiation resistance from a dipole antenna like this is 73 ohms, which is four to one difference. And it's exactly what you'd expect because both of these antenna assemblies are going to produce identical radiated powers. Um, so if you have half the current going into the folded dipole, power is I squared R. So half the current is would normally give you a quarter of the power. So clearly you need four times the radiation resistance to get the same power. So it's just interesting that with a folded dipole, the radiation resistance is, is four times. And the consequence is the current is half what you would expect into the base of the antenna. The other thing is that um, with the folded dipole, the current in each leg is half. Whereas with our simple example that we started with up here, um, where is it? 
Yeah, so the current was being reduced by root two for two antenna elements, not by two. So you can see that something has gone wrong with our simple model. Anyway, so now we can try to correct our model. So the way we're going to do this is to consider the power radiated by an isotropic radiator. Um, it's just power divided by the area of a spherical surface. And in this case, we're using four pi, we're using steradians rather than square meters. Um, and we know that the power from an isotropic antenna must be the same as the power from our antenna array. And we can calculate the antenna from the uh, the power from the array by integrating the power flux density from the array, which is this, and it's dependent on angles theta and phi. We integrate that over all solid angles. And I've divided by a factor called current squared reduction. So um, you'll see why I've done that in a moment. But this is the integral, um, and we can clearly equate the power that we put into our isotropic antenna and the power that we put into our antenna assembly. Um, and if we do that, and we use Maple's solve function, we can see that the current squared reduction factor is this integral divided by four times the power from an isotropic antenna. Now you probably remember, if I go back up to the uh, our original model, um, we, we normalized by dividing by the magnetic field strength for the isotropic antenna. So what we can do when we come back down here is we can set the isotropic power flux density to unity. So we just end up with dividing by four pi, and that's what we've got here. So this current squared reduction, um, I've reproduced it here. And if we consider our original example, which is two antenna elements spaced half a wavelength apart, we calculate the current squared reduction and we end up with two. And that's exactly what we'd expect. Um, it means that the current into each antenna element is root two, and that's what we assumed originally. So if we modify our original formula using current squared reduction and plot it, we see our familiar donut so there's zero gain on the Z axis and a gain of two in the X, Y plane. So that's exactly what we had originally, which is encouraging. Um, now we can reduce the antenna spacing a little. So this is with antennas spaced lambda by four, quarter of a wavelength. Um, when we calculate the current squared reduction, it's now slightly larger. It's increased to 3.2. And then if we calculate and visualize using plot 3D, we can see that the gains reduce slightly and um, we've got a, a non-zero gain now in the z-axis. So what's happened is if we look at our donut, we've taken some power from outside and we've used it to fill in the donut slightly. That's what's going on. And then finally, if we reduce the spacing to zero, um, we end up with a current squared reduction of four. And this is exactly like the folded dipole example. Um, if I flip back, you can see that we had a four to one difference in radiation resistance, um, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. So we've got a current squared reduction of four, and when we apply that using plot 3D, we end up with an isotropic radiation pattern. So we've got a gain of one in all directions, and this is what we'd expect. If we take two isotropic antenna elements and place them on top of each other, we would expect the resultant to have an isotropic radiation pattern. In exactly the same way that with our folded dipole, if you take two dipole elements and place them on top of each other, you end up with an antenna pattern that's equivalent to a dipole. So it all checks out. So now we've got a working model. It's convenient to uh, use a procedure to visualize this. So this is how the procedure is used. Um, the first argument is element type, um, and the procedure accepts elements, isotropic, dipole, or Hertzian dipole. You can obviously add other antenna elements if you'd like to. Um, the next three arguments, A, B, C, give the number of array elements in the X, Y, and Z direction. Um, small d is the distance between the elements. Um, so this, for example, could be lambda by two or zero. Um, and then there's a plot title. And these are the 
expressions for the array element patterns. So the isotropics one, there's no phi or phi in this. The isotropic radiates equally in all directions. This is the expression for a Hertzian dipole, and this is a half wave dipole. Uh, this section here, I'll just expand it so you can see, but this section is where all of the procedures are. Um, and you can see this one here, uh, this is where we calculate the current squared reduction factor, and that should look familiar. Incidentally, one of the nice features about Maple, if I just close that window down, shrink that section, is that um, copy and paste works rather well. So for example, having got this um, expression to work to calculate current squared reduction, I've just copied it. If I create a new document um, and add a code edit region to it, and now I can paste into it. It's rather clever, isn't it? So I, I copied 2D maths, but if you paste into a code edit region, you get, um, I guess, 1D without any typos. It's rather clever. <laughs> anyway, um, we can now see some examples. So this is using the procedure plot array pattern. Um, this is for an isotropic antenna element, two elements in the Z plane half a wavelength apart. So we've seen this example many times before. It's our familiar donut with a gain of two. Um, the only thing now is you can see these blue spheres represent the array elements. So you can sort of visualize where they are, which is quite helpful. And I've turned some the transparency on just so that you can always see them as you rotate the antenna pattern. This is exactly the same thing, but now the antenna elements are one wavelength apart. And because of that, we've now got radiation in the along the z-axis because the um, uh, signals add in phase along the z-axis now, as well as in the xy plane. Um, and we've just got more examples. This is a two by two array of isotropic antennas. Four by four arrays. Interesting. You can see there's quite a lot of gain here. Um, this is the sort of antenna system that may be used in mobile phones, perhaps in the high frequency bands, you know, the 30 gigahertz, 26 gigahertz frequency range, path loss increases at high frequencies. So um, instead of using more transmitter power, I expect what the mobile operators will do is just use more gain at each end of the link. And probably actually most of the gain will go into the base station because they're less power constrained than a mobile. Um, this one's just for fun. So this is a four by four by four array of isotropic radiators. It just looks nice. I don't think it's got any practical use. Um, and then we've got some dipole plots. You do actually see pairs of dipoles used in communication systems sometimes. Um, and this one's very commonly used. It's colloquially known as a four stack. Uh, it's four dipoles stacked along the Z axis. So up the mast. And it's quite often used in private mobile radio base station sites. And you can see why it gives you quite a lot of gain um, in a sort of a thin disk. So it's a normally directional antenna with a reasonable amount of gain, which is just the job private mobile radio. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Um, if you can think of any ways to improve this document, please let me know. I'd be very interested to hear from you. Thanks for listening.